Um, I just thought I'd we do a lot of just measuring performance on small machines, on big machines. I thought I'd just share a few thoughts on um, where we'd got to on that. But before that, I couldn't help pointing out this tune. This is just for you. It's a tenth. It's a. It's um, uh, Christopher Fenton's um, tenth size uh, Cray One on uh, an FPGA. Um, well, I mean, old, original Cray one's about this high, so it's a tenth of that. So, yeah. okay, so yeah, I, th I think I'm right in saying that the old Cray ones, they, they don't tell you, they're never on the ground floor, because underneath is the refrigeration unit to cool them down. <laughs> so anyway, right. Anyway, so this is just really a summary of, of useful things on performance. What do you use for performance analysis? Well. Ideally, you've actually got your chip, and that could be an ASIC or it could be an FPGA. The advantage ASICs will go nice and fast. FPGA, not so fast. Next thing is they could be design models. If you haven't got your chip yet, you can use QEMU, very, very fast. Um, you can use CGen or TableGen if you're an LLVM person to generate uh, a simulator, or you can handwrite. Uh, a, a simulator. And I call them design models because the models are typically written to meet the specification as opposed for implementation models which are based on the actual implementation. And if you've got Verilog or VHDL but you haven't yet actually got your chip, you can use tools like Verilator or GHDL to actually give you a cycle accurate model. Or indeed, you can even use a hardware simulator, so event driven simulators like uh, Incisive. Um, and Basically, as you go down the page, they get slower and slower, um, uh, but more and more accurate, except hardware is as accurate as anything. Um, and of course, if you're just worried about performance in the sense of code size performance, you don't actually need a target to see how good the compiler is going. Um, so what is performance? Uh, speed, um, how long does your code take to execute? Um, size, how big is your program? If you're in the embed, you might think that's just the top of the text segments. But of course, if you're in an embedded world, your code's likely to be in a ROM and you want to know how big that ROM's got to be. So you ought to put in the RO data, the read only data. But in fact, you need to put in the data as well, because even though data is the writable data, you have to initialize it, and that initialization stuff has to go in the ROM. So there are what you mean by size is not quite black and white. But you can measure other things, and that over there is one of the Magic project boards that we built uh, for, for measuring how much energy a small board uh, computer uses. It, it intercepts the power lines to the chip and samples voltage and current about two million times a second. Um, I've got a load of those left over. If anyone wants one, ping me an email and I'll put one in the post. I can see Mr. Malcolm looking very interested. Yeah. And But anything, you, performance may be other things. You can measure other things. You may be interested in how, how heavily your cache is used, but we're not going to go into that today. As long as you can measure it, it's useful. So what do we want in a benchmark? I, for benchmarks to be easily adopted, you want them to be free. Open, free in the sense of GNU is free. Um, easy to port and run. It's no use having a benchmark if it's a nightmare to get it working. This is one which really matters, which is based on a set of real programs. And you'll see that I am not a fan of Drystone or Cormark, which are synthetic benchmarks. You've actually got to deal with real code. And if you look at the benchmarks I'm going to talk about today, you'll see they're a mixture of real programs. They're different styles. They're different idioms and so forth. Um, benchmarks die if you don't look after them. So you need an organization to maintain it. Ultimately, you've got to have a way of summarizing the result. You don't just want a collection. Here's a table of all the values, because people do want to be able to say, what does that mean in summary? So summary score matters. One thing about measuring performance, and again, this affects the ones we're going to do, is it's very easy when you have a benchmark suite of programs for one program to dominate. So there's two things you can do with that. Choose a baseline reference platform for your measurements and measure everyone else relative to that. So it's not hey, this program's fast, how fast is it compared to the baseline? And secondly, 
Do your averages using geometric means and um, geometric standard deviation. Geometric mean because it tends to flatten out outsiders, out, out, outliers. Stand, and measure the standard deviation so you can see what variability you've got, so you can see if there is a problem. And lastly, it needs collaboration. It needs the insight, the vision, the, the blue sky thinking of academia, but it also needs the practical real world of industry involved. Now, um, so from that we get two benchmarks we like, spec CPU. Spec CPU has an organization to maintain it. It's, it's, not, it's not actually free, it's not very expensive, and it is based on free programs, but the infrastructure you actually have to pay for. So it loses out on that one, but it uses a summarizing score based on geometric means, and it does ratios and so forth. Um, and then the one that I am a biased observer of, because I'm one of the developers of mBench, um, mBench, which is um, meets all those criteria, because those criteria I put you are actually on the mBench slide. I just took the word mBench out of them. Um, and spec CPU is for application class processors. mBench. MBench is actually more than one benchmark, but the one everyone calls MBench is MBench IoT is for the very smallest processors, sub 64K, tiny little microcontrollers. There are other benchmarks under development in MBench. There's MBench DSP for DSPs, there's MBench RT for real time performance. But for now, MBench, I mean MBench IoT. Benchmarks we don't like Cormark and Drystone. They're synthetic, they're a single program, they don't get maintained. Spec CPU gets refreshed every few years. We're on spec through 2017. I think there's a new one coming out this year. Um, so they get refreshed. mBench 2.0 is about to come out. Um, so that comes from having a maintained organization, whether it's the, uh, the spec organization or mBench is maintained as part of the free and open source Silicon Foundation. So having got that, let's have a look at a couple of these. Uh, I've, I thought I'd just pick out some interesting ones. This is RISC-V and ARM. And looking at, using mBench, so with microcontrollers, we're comparing a CV32E40P V2, which is the latest Core 5 open hardware group microcontroller on FPGA, against an ARM Cortex-M4. They're normalized for clock speed, OK? So for comparison, so uh, the the the... Core 5 is running at 15 meg, the megahertz, the ARM at 16 megahertz, and it's a Cortex M4 with no floating point enabled. And what we can see there is if we look at the execution speed, and I've done them as relative scores from mBench. These aren't mBench scores, these are relative. They're using mBench 2.0, and we can see that over the last seven years, uh, Risk 5, as it matures, is catching up to the level of maturity of ARM and it's getting closer in performance but is still not quite as good as the Cortex M4. And the same with ARM versus RISC-5 on code size. The code's getting smaller in both cases, but actually RISC-5 is catching up on ARM, which is sort of what you expect. And you can use it to compare compilers. This is GCC events LLVM. mBench 2.0 is so new, I haven't redone this for mBench 2.0. And I don't, uh, this, is, this is GCC 14.1. So, uh, GCC used to be a lot better than LLVM for RISC-V. They're now getting very close. They're within 3% of each, each other. And what you can see from this is that some, um, some programs, uh, LLVM does better, some GCC does better. That's very good for compiler development, because you can go and look at each compiler and say, what are they doing that I'm not doing? Can I learn from that? Okay. Um, and then... Here's another one. This is code size comparison for ARM against uh, RISC-V. And what I've done is I've looked at the relative code size of each of the benchmarks, and then I've ordered them by how big it is. So on the left, we have the ones where ARM is way smaller than RISC-V, and on the right, the ones where RISC-V is way smaller than ARM. And again, you start to get intuition. It's not all the compiler. A bit of this is Nettle SHA-256. ARM has instructions that help with SHA-256, which RISC-5 doesn't. Um, but it allows you insight into the compiler. Why is it that, um, which is it, StateMate does so well on RISC-5? So there's something for the ARM compiler team to learn from that. Um, and some of these other ones, why does ARM do so well? Is there something to learn? OK, thank you. Um, 
And this then feeds into optimization. So this is um, iterative uh, optimization. There's a number of techniques. This is just plain iterative op optimization, where you turn on all the optimization flags and then knock them out, knock one of them out, and try each knocking out each of the optimization flags to see which one has the most negative effect, and then you get rid of that one. And you keep on knocking out flags until nothing makes it worse, and you come up with this set of um, um, flags. And if you compile your RISC V program with these flags, you'll be about 7% smaller than just saying minus OS. Okay, and this is done with mbench, so it's done across 19 programs. It's a good basis for actually exploring that. And that's before we even get into the compiler. Optimization, um, this is where we started with RISC V vector. With the banana pie, this is starting to become obsolete. The only thing we could optimize RISC V vector was instruction counts. And again, here, these are the spec CPU 2017 benchmarks. And we can put them side by side, risk five vector against non-vector, and see where the vector is having an effect, give us some insight into optimizations. OK, and that was it. Yes, David. Is it coincident that the same letters as It isn't, but they have a common reason, because they're the first three letters of embedded. And M because comes from embedded, and it was an embedded benchmark. So, so anything to do with embedded is derived from M because of. No, no, it isn't, no. No, no. And I didn't choose it. Other people chose it, I hasten to add. Yeah. So, you said in the beginning that uh, the is not important to me that you see. The target certainly is important. Yeah, yeah, very. Sorry, I, if I did, that was, um, uh, what was it, misspoke. Yes. Uh, you said something that you don't need a target for it. For code size. To for measure, to measure code size, I can just... Comp Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yeah, you certainly do. And one of the differences with mbench 2.0, mbench 1.0, we just worried about measuring code. So, we put dummy libraries in. But it meant that you didn't know if the code worked. mbench 2.0, the programs are executable. So, you can prove not only have you made the, what size it is, but the programs still continue to run. And they're self verifying programs. Okay, yeah, no, good point. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.